All right, I'm back. <clears throat> um, thank you for entertaining me for the third or fourth time on stage today. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting conversation. The timing is right. Just before this, we had a conversation how things work in, you know, from a venture perspective for startups. Now we just flip that script. And with me, I have really amazing guests today who will be talking about uh, their perspective, the investor's perspective, and uh, what to look for uh, within the Web3. Uh, so with me, I have Lior Messica, Lauren Sugarman, David Strang, and Ilana Dickman. So before we get into the Q&A and discussion, uh, why don't you give a quick 20-second intro uh, for each of you, please. All right, hey guys, I'm Lior Masika. I'm the founder of Eden Block. We're uh, a Web3 first uh, um, VC firm that specializes in infrastructure. Uh, so decentralized board protocols, middleware, all that boring stuff um, that powers your most amazing applications. Uh, that's what we tend to back, and yeah, um, that's me. Uh, I'm Lauren Sugarman, CEO of Metaverse Group. Uh, I guess I'm on this panel not for CEO of Metaverse Group, but I was a 15-year investment banker back in the mid-90s during the dot-com era. So I lived through multiple cycles, nine-year health tech CEO, and a seed and Series A investor personally in, in multiple different companies and sit on multiple different private company boards. I'm David Trang, so one of the founders of Leapbook Partners. We are blockchain and digital assets uh, venture capital fund, and we're literally investing in all infrastructure or product that will enable the next leg of growth. Um, for, for crypto. And hi everybody, I'm Alana. I work at Redbeard Ventures. Uh, we're a Web3 VC. We started as a syndicate about two years ago, then have now been growing our fund and making it investments out of that. Fantastic. So the intro is out of the way. Um, so let's uh, get into the weeds, right? Alana, um, if you've been in conversation around various Web3 trends and investments, you guys have a syndicate right, uh, you're raising a fund. So what are, maybe we start with, like what are some of the interesting Web3 opportunities that you as an investor is excited about? Yeah, so there's a couple things that I specifically have looked for and I've sourced for Red Bear Ventures. Um, so one of the things I'm excited about is unstoppable domains. Uh, as m most people know of ENS domains, unstoppable domains helps your digital identity um, another one is DAO infrastructure. So another one we did with Zero Tech from the founders of Wild World, the end-to-end -end DAO infrastructure. Um, and then another one is Cube. It's a proof of behavior protocol. Um, the founders have had insane uh, exits in the past, but really just either helping that next generation of crypto adapters get into the space. And then also, I love DAO infrastructures and how we're really going to create these decentralized autonomous organizations. And Lauren, I guess the same question, um, being part of the metaverse and seeing a lot of activity around this, um, how does that differ? Or it or is it still what uh, Ilana mentioned? Are those patterns, uh, investment patterns and trends similar as you look at the broader ecosystem? So for us, it's, it's different. You know, we're looking at uh, different elements around our business. So for an example is, I think it came up in conversation over the past couple of days, is business intelligent tools, for example, around metaverse and wallets and NFTs and those types of items are extremely important and things that we're looking for and we're looking for companies to partner with or acquire or work with that have those types of tools. I think the, you know, the other side of it is we're looking for, again, for partnerships to bring to the metaverse that, that have you know, projects that have, for lack of a better way of saying it, or companies that have communities or have ways to build upon communities. Because one of the things most of these metaverses still lack today is people and adoption. So we need to find those types of unique activities or unique companies that can bring users to the metaverses to drive activity and drive value and, frankly, our real estate portfolios. So those are a couple of items that are very important to us. How about you, David? I guess the first thing I want to say about the trends is, I don't know if you counted the number of times people, like all of us are mentioning now the word Web3 versus last year and two years ago. And literally, it's the same thing. Like we haven't changed the infrastructure, it has improved for sure, but we just switched from blockchain and crypto that was scammy and understandable, 
can't be applied to Web3 and everybody understands it now, every single corporate, which I think is great because the analogy to move from a state which is centralized or semi-centralized to more decentralized with more freedom or at least interaction with the public is great. So I'd say for me, like I'll mention probably like two trends and I'll quote uh, what we've seen in the previous um, cycle in terms of investment back in 2010, 2014, which was financial crisis led to, you know, a lack of trust around the banking ecosystem that has also led to the first leg around the retails. So with fintechs, you had a lot of new banks emerging and taking that step. If you're thinking right now about crypto, it emerged on the back of retails. So all the infrastructure that was built initially was to answer a simple challenge, which was how can I buy, how can I sell, how can I hold um, crypto assets very easy, and that was the exchanges. So that part has been built right now. You're seeing the, the winners emerging. What is going to be critical, pretty much like on the fintech side with the neobanks, is to optimize on the back end. So when you see all of that with the fintechs, a lot of flow, you need to find alternative ways to the traditional Visa, to the traditional MasterCard, and that's the reason why you saw guys like Checkout.com emerge and take a massive share. Those guys are also very involved you know, in the crypto space. So that's one trend that, as a fund, we're looking at very heavily because what matters to me is to understand two things. One, what is going to be the business vertical that is going to become strategically positioned in tomorrow's world, regardless of if it's gaming that, that, that pick up first, if it's NFT, if it's metaverse, like whichever vertical. And that's for me like the number one on, on that front. The second one is, where is there enough appetite from a corporate and institutional point of view to deploy that capital? Because you can have the greatest idea, the greatest product market fit, but if there's a budget behind, you're going to go nowhere. So that's the, um, I'd say that that's one of the uh, uh, massive trends that I'm looking very closely. David, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to ask exactly that on the appetite piece. So maybe, Lior, we start with you. Um, you know, so what we are calling is a crypto downturn, but compared to previous cycles where things would go into crypto winter and we have had like two cycles, we still don't feel cold as uh, the lot of uh, growth mentioned earlier in the panel, um, but we're still experiencing a massive building cycle, right, that continues to grow. So from an investor's perspective, how has the appetite changed compared to say previous cycles or even right before we started seeing this downturn come to life? It's a great question. Um, I'm still hungry. I think the, the most important thing to try to understand is like, what should you be actually um, measuring, right? So when it comes to measuring appetite from institutions, so whether it's institutional LPs or family offices or even the VCs, so the, the, the capital deployers themselves, so whoever here is on this stage, it all comes down to the fundamentals of the space. And so like, you know, it's not really cold for us, but besides price action, which might be a good indicator of, you know, retail um, appetite, because again, like, most of the institutional capital that I'm aware of is still very much looking for entry points into the space through a variety of different kind of strategies. And what, what is really interesting is that while two, three, four years ago, you might be looking at a crypto VC and saying, hey, you understand crypto better than me. I'm just going to park my money with you because know, you, you've got a, a good track record, et cetera, et cetera. I think now we're starting to see these really, really specialized players just try to um, build and create value in a, in a drastically different way, right? So I, I think that now the, the VC model itself has to change in order to satisfy this kind of appetite. And so, for example, you know, we are completely uh, focused on infrastructure. I personally am invested in NFTs and shitcoins and whatever, but when it comes to our fund and our kind of our firm's thesis, we have to focus on the things that to us, you know, can be a tool, not the toolbox. Because I don't think that anybody's looking for the toolbox anymore because the fund of funds and the, and the, and the big institutional uh, um, LPs with that kind of appetite that we're kind of referring to are looking for tools because they are the toolbox. And so for, for me as a VC, I think it becomes more and more important to understand differentiation, market positioning, and again, ultimately, how can you become the founder's wet dream to an extent, right? And so for us, I know that I cannot be you know, every founder's wet dream, but if I can try to fit, you know, um, something that, that founders that I focus on 
really, really need, you know, in all kinds of ways, then, you know, I'm making progress. And then that engenders even more appetite and, and people get really, really interested in that, at least from the institutional perspective, because it just makes sense. So focus, in, in short. Focus. No, I 100% agree. And I know uh, Ilana and David um, and, and Lauren as well, I think the same question, but from, you know, an investor perspective, yes. But also when you are seeing the appetite from the LPs as you try to raise the funds, how has that been impacted? It's been hard. I mean, I think when we first started, so we started in February, really, the market was crashing. We're trying to get people to invest their money. Nobody knows where it's going. It's pretty bearish. Um, it was definitely hard to raise money. We're still raising. We're raising $50 million. We have about 25 mil in the door. Uh, but I think it's getting people comfortable. Like crypto, Web3, it's not going away. We're still making investments out of the fund. We're very active. We're very active investors in the syndicate. So it's really trying to tell a story. I mean, it's similar to the companies that we're investing in. They're coming to us, even in this bear market, they're still working, they're still building, and they're telling you the story of how they're starting, what they're building, and same goes for us. Like we live and breathe this space. We want to, believe and invest in the next generation of crypto users, infrastructure behind Web3. So I think it's just getting people comfortable about where it's at and really letting them know about where the market's going because, yeah, as I mentioned, it's not stopping, so. I mean, on, on, on the LP side, so capital allocation has shifted pretty heavily over the past two years. So if you go back to pre-COVID and post-COVID, there was a lot of capital that was literally parked in, uh, in risky assets. And when you had the massive correction, that was a macro uh, factor as well. You started to see people moving out cash, or sorry, moving out capital from risky assets to cash. But then when you had you know, the massive correction happening, there was a massive opportunity. So initially you started to get capital flowing back into you know, the uh, public equities market, but also people were looking still at opportunities on the private side for one simple reason you had correction from 40 to 60% uh, back in 2020, if you're looking at public markets, but it started to rebound very heavily, especially for the software as a service companies. So if you were a private equity, if you were an asset manager, or if you were a hedge fund, the only way for you to not underperform the market was to look at pre-IPOs. And those companies were able to absorb hundreds and hundreds of million, and generally speaking, if you're putting a Fidelity, a Schroeder's, or those kind of names, behind the table on the pre-IPO, you will make a two, three, five X. The big challenge today is that those companies, like those asset managers, were also asset allocators into funds. But to be honest, a big chunk of them invested pre-IPO, the business went IPO, and now probably the, the value of their assets on an NAV basis is cr probably close to 50 to 80% down, but they're still locked because it is a vesting period. So landscape is tricky mainly for you know, the, the asset allocation part, but there's still family offices, high net worth that have built the conviction, and now they're trying to increase their exposure simply because they realize that across all the trends from an industry point of view, you know, crypto, Web3, whichever way you want to call it, is probably the only market where the addressable market continue to expand year after year for one simple reason. There's an increased education over time, and that by definition increases the appetite of the corporate, which then lead that, lead that on to, uh, to the consumers. So, very tricky market. I mean, the VCs will tell you that they are doing completely fine, they're probably lying to you because everybody's suffering right now, and it's important to say it. But I think it's a, it's a great reset to bring expectations to the level where they should be, and therefore see who are the investors that have done their homeworks over the past one, two, or even six months, and therefore have the backing of those ones because they're gonna be the, the LPs that are gonna be the most useful. LPs is similar to a VC that are backing founders as well. They're extremely active in most of the cases, or some of us don't want to, to be active and they're passive, and that's completely fine as well. Yeah, just to double click on what David, you just said, um, it's really funny because pre this kind of correction in the market, um, Look, we, we started our firm in, uh, I think, late 2016, early 2017. And what most of our LPs asked us when we were raising our first funds, um, which we're now towards the end of, uh, is like, 
hey, were you able to deploy capital during that time successfully? And now the question is, are you able to show restraint? Have you been able to show restraint in the last year or so, ever since shit went down, essentially? Um, because, and it's the same LPs, right? Because now we're raising our second fund, and it's like, same question, or same people, but different questions. And it has to do with, like, are you able to show, um, I guess, enough appetite as a capital allocator into, obviously, great deals? Because if you don't get the great deals, then that doesn't matter at all. Um, and nobody wants to give you money. But, but before this market correction, it was all about, like, okay, 2012 to 2017, best time ever to allocate capital into especially early stage venture capital, okay? And now it's like, all right, nobody's expecting crazy numbers anymore. Everybody wants to see like where it all shakes out after you know the dust settles and stuff like that. And, and so now the questions are drastically different. It's like, are, have you been able to mitigate risk? Have you been able to, you know, maximize returns under time, et cetera, et cetera, and like, you know, run your fund like a proper VC and not like some degen um, that you might meet on on the internet or whatever? And so I think I think that that's no, but seriously, like, ultimately in in 2016, 2017, it was really easy to to be like, all right, let's go Solana or let's go uh, Luna, and then you know shit hits the fan and, and, and it doesn't really look like that anymore, especially not now. And so the questions that we're kind of fielding is, okay, are you able to, to, to be still a really successful investor when the tides are completely different and, and especially where there's a storm outside and you're supposed to like bring calm to your portfolio, to your LPs and to the people that essentially end up backing you. So yeah, just to double click on what David said, it's just a different climate right now and we need to adjust. Yeah, no, I think that that statement has opened up a Pandora's box. So I'm going to ask a slightly controversial question here. Nothing to worry about. Um, so when you think about investments, this is for the entire panel here. How much of it is, is formal based and why? And how much it is is original conviction? And if it is original conviction, what determines it a worthy investment? But if it's a formal, we get it. So. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to start, I guess. So I think it's, I would say my personal investment, like I do the shit coins, I do the NFTs, like those are definitely done the FOMO base. But I think when it comes to investments, I mean, I have before looked at the main investors, the A16Z, Sequoia, Tiger Global, and that's what I would consider the FOMO, at least in this space, because you're looking at these main investors and you're like, okay, if they're all investing, maybe I'm missing something. But I think when we actually look at the investments for the fund, at the end of the day, when we're looking, we're not looking at where the main investor is going, but we actually have a thesis for, okay, what does this space need? Where do we think this space is going? And then this is why we ultimately decide to make this investment. But I think at least that's why I like to believe from a venture capital perspective, like we're definitely looking into the numbers. Um, we do pre C to series A, but usually right around the seed. So we're seeing some traction, we're seeing their market, we're seeing how they're actually going and acquiring users. I think from that perspective, we're looking at a lot more um, than just a normal FOMO situation. David, Lauren, your same question. I mean, on, on, the, on the FOMO side, um, generally speaking, if I'm saying that I'm always excluding FOMO would be a complete lie. So generally what I tend to do is I'm looking at, co at a company that uh, I know today doesn't have FOMO, but can generate FOMO later on. So I can sell everything in secondary. No, it's a joke. Uh, <laughs> but no, jo joke aside, literally what, what, what is always important, and especially on FOMO, it's always depending on which stage of the fund you are in and which state of maturity you invest in. So what I mean by that is, if you're launching your, your first fund, for instance, generally speaking, most of the questions that LPs are gonna ask is, What's your deal flow? How do you, do you have access to the best deal? Who are you co-investing with? And in those circumstances, if you are a small emerging fund and you're leading, the probability of, of bringing you know, an A16Z, a Sequoia, uh, an Edo Sophia or another is difficult because those guys tend to lead as well. So the impact that you're gonna have on the shorter and longer term is relatively minimal for what you're targeting, which is a bigger fund to be able to exploit and deploy your strategy. But if you want fund two, three, and four, you are the VC that needs to create that FOMO. And that FOMO is typically driven by your track record, but also the trust that other co-investors have on you. So it's always down to the same thing at the end of the day. Long story short, it's always about the fundamentals. If the fundamentals are strong, and you have a sequence where you can assess 
where every single dollar is going and how it's returning an ROI, then FOMO is going to come in. And Lauren, uh, Leo, do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm slightly different. I don't have LP pressures like anyone else here, so I, I invest for myself. But, uh, but uh, good for you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the the long story short is, you know, I definitely have made my share of FOMO investments uh, and late stage uh, investments, pre-IPO type stuff. Certainly over the past cycle, largely because you can see the FOMO is happening. It's an opportunity to capitalize on that. But Mostly what I do is, like I said, seed and Series A type investments. And to me, there's theses that I follow, and the th basic thesis I follow is if I'm, if I'm knowledgeable in the space. So if I have a previous he history, if it's a space that I know about, I'm going to invest in that space. That's the first box. Do I agree with the thesis? Do I agree with the industry? Do I agree with what's going on? The second check mark that I've learned over the past 20 years, that is one I will always stick to, is it's the management team. I have to believe in the management team, and there has to be a way that I have contact with that management team somehow in history, whether that's through another venture investor that I'm involved with, whether that's through personal contacts, whatever that is, because if that's not the case, I won't make that investment because what I've learned over the years, we all get things wrong, we all pivot, and if that management team isn't a good management team, they won't be able to pivot and they won't be able to move their business to capitalize and ultimately they'll fail for sure. And so if you have a good management team and a shitty industry, for lack of a better way of saying it, they will ultimately at least break even is my view most of the times, whereas if you have an amazing industry and a shitty management team, they'll still fail. Very well said. Yeah, about, about the FOMO point, right? So same question. I think, um, okay, I'm a little bit more extreme in that sense where there's two things that lead to FOMO. The first one is the most obvious, it's FOMO. Right? But the second thing that leads to FOMO is actually great fundamentals. And so I'll give you an example. Like The last round that we led was for a, a seed round for a company called FAIR. Okay? FAIR, an amazing, amazing management team, all of that stuff. And like, we knew that like, the market was ripe for, for what they were creating we, for the team. I mean, the, the, the team, like the founder market fit was huge. Uh, everything just went in the right way. And even in this like, Horrible market, very like you know unknowns, lots of unknowns. They ended up raising 4.55 million dollars, um, like 4.55 million dollars, and in terms of commitments, they had like 27. Okay, so and we didn't want to raise the valuation. We still wanted to work together, blah blah. But you know, a company like that, who's got who's got all the check marks, um, at least at the fundamental level, will generate crazy FOMO. And, and especially, and like I said, so then you, you create FOMO by having this kind of fundamentals first, and then the additional FOMO, you know, just kind of, it, it just, it's kind of like a snowball. But what I, what I think is, every time I've made a FOMO decision, like FOMO-based decision, I've regretted it. And so I, I think it has to go with, like, your thesis, what are you out there trying to do? Like, what are you delivering to your investors? Like, I mean, for me as a VC, I, I, I always try to think, how will my LPs, uh, react to any decision that I make and I think look like w we're very stringent we, we have very specific things that we're looking for in, in a market uh, in a team and in an investment and, and, and I think it makes your job easier to know that you've got like really really narrow path on which you can walk and if you if you it derail from that path okay tough you know tough business it's like that's that's your problem but I think uh, ultimately FOMO is is fleeting and and fundamentals are strong. So yeah, I, I think that's mostly what we try to stick with. There, there's probably one thing I just add to add to, to what Leary is saying is that generally speaking, either on a personal or you know institutional level, when you start to see FOMO not on one deal but across the entire sector, you should probably get out. As founders, you should raise as much capital as possible because you're gonna get towards the down round. So generally speaking, I always say that the best success stories are always born in the bear market, not during the FOMO time. The FOMO time is the time to capitalize as well when you were saying. So right now, there's FOMO in single-sided deals. There's no FOMO into the space. So great time to build, great time to execute. The day you start to feel that FOMO goes across the board, people don't look at the deck and just say, I'm, I'm putting a check of 50 mil or 100 mil. Take the money and then just wait for the bear market to happen and then you're gonna to start to, to hire and execute and it's gonna be just fine. Fantastic, whoops, looks like our time's up. 
Uh, yes, so that's but before we wrap up, I would like to see if there's any questions from the audience. We have some minutes, so... I have anyone? one question. Can I? Of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't let these guys go without asking one question. You have a crystal ball. What comes next as part of your investment thesis? What, sh what are you excited about? Um, one word answer. Decentralization. <laughs> Better valuations. Small to capital. I was thinking better valuations, but I'll go yeah. with that one too. Cool. That was my question. Perfect. Well, All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for listening in. And thank you, our panel, panel guests, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting.